Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, a brother that is very well known to the MGEU, probably known to at least three quarters of the room, and for the quarter that don't know him, you will know him by the time he's done his speech. Uh, brother James Clancy is the national president of the National Union of Public and General Employees Union, or employees. First elected in June of 1990, James was re-elected at Newt Chi's uh, June 2013 convention and is serving his eighth term as national president. He is also general vice president of the Canadian Labour Congress. He ser serves in an international leadership capacity with Public Services International at the International Federation of over 500 public service unions representing 20 million workers in 140 countries. Previously, he served as president of the 120,000 member Ontario Public Service Employees Ontario for six years. He was first elected at OPSU in 1984 at the age of 34, making him the youngest leader to lead a major Canadian union. And with that, please help me welcome Brother James Clancy. Well, with many thanks to my nominator. No, no. You voted for the last time today. Okay. Listen, uh, what a day, eh? What a couple of days. Um, conventions, oh boy, they're just, you know, you're meeting people, you think you remember their names, then you do, and then, then oh, wait a, wait a second, on top of that, we're going to vote. We're going to have elections. I like the conventions where it's the off year, right? No elections. I just find my heart rate drops, you know? Yeah? I want to bring you, first of all, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of uh, Larry Brown. Larry Brown and I very rarely, Larry Brown's the secretary treasurer, my comrade in arms, my compadre. We've worked together for years across the country, battles, fighting, and so on and so forth. This is one of the rare times that he and I are at the same convention at the same time. Yeah? I'll explain a little, a little later why that happened. But uh, on behalf of Larry and Susie Prudeg, who's out from uh, New Brunswick, and there's a couple of sisters from SGU, uh, and our, I want to say to each of you how much we appreciated the, um, the generosity and the kindness that you've shown us while we, we've been here this last couple of days, talking to you in the hallways and at night, the dinner and so on and so forth. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, I also, of course, bring greetings on behalf of Larry and the others from our executive across the country, our, our leadership across the country, and from women and men, just like yourselves, hardworking people, people that are Delivering public services, it means everything to them, their work, the importance of their work, and at the same time, they're trade unionists. Eh? So on behalf of those women and men, activists like yourself, I want to bring greetings and an expression of solidarity from them. Yeah? Uh, I, on, on their behalf, I want to congratulate Michelle and Wayne and Steve and Jackie uh, for uh, running and uh, offering to serve and uh, winning your races this afternoon. I want to thank Wally Fletcher and Peter Roberts. Wally I worked with on the National Executive Board for a couple of years, this past couple of years. I appreciate his work. We appreciate his work. And, and uh, Peter Roberts, of course, I've worked with over the last few years. So I want to congratulate them for the service they gave us and I want to thank them for the work uh, that they did. The, for the new members that are here today, it must seem a bit strange at times, eh? Um, you know, people are asking you who you're gonna vote for and they're encouraging you to vote for people, right? You've got all of that in your plate. But I, th I think the strangest thing are the, uh, are the debates around resolutions, constitutional resolutions in particular, eh? Do you find that? I mean, I remember my first convention, first convention I ever went to, new delegate. Boy, I was full of piss and I was full of uh, uh, in, in enthusiasm, right? I was so excited. I was going to the big show, right? I finally won and I was going off to the convention. And uh, it was at OPSU, the, the, I was president of OPSU. OPSU was, uh, boy, we, it was going through a really difficult time, 
really difficult time. Uh, really, the politics were rough and raw and ready. Uh, so there was that, that buffeting with that. But also, they, uh, they were seized with a whole series of constitutional resolutions they were trying to get through. Well, talk about confused. Oh, my God, referral, second, third, who's doing it? Two thirds, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to say to the new tele delegates, this too shall pass. Yeah, yeah, trust me. We need to take care of that stuff to make sure that the House is tight, that there's integrity in the House in terms of the Constitution. But that's not where our real work lies, is it? You know, our real work lies out there with the boss, eh? And with the public and with our co workers as we try and get them to join with us in the struggles that we face. But, you know, at this meeting, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the fact that it's been a very passionate convention. There are different views being expressed. Uh, clearly, the last few years, MGU had, uh, had leadership for some 20 years under Peter Olford. And over the last couple of terms, you've had new leaders, and, and Michelle ended up in the seat. And there she's trying to lead the thing, and it's been difficult two years. We know that standing outside. But I want to remind you, don't reinvent the wheel, because <laughs> we've been through it before. Others have been through it before. Don't stay in that space, the space that some of the candidates have talked about. You know, the politics, the sort of politics that you're, that you're wrestling with, that you're going through. You must remember, and I say this to new delegates if I could be so, so bold as to say this to new delegates, is that what we stand for as trade unionists, to be a trade unionist, it's a calling. I mean, to take that kind of criticism that you take day in, day out, what did the union do for me? I paid my dues and you haven't solved my grievance. What did the darn union do for me? And the boss is on you and you've got your family responsibilities and you're trying to deliver the public services that you're paid to do at your job. We know, we of us, those of us here that have, have, have done it, we know what you're going through. So as new delegates, I want to remind you that the values are what really bind us, which keep us hanging together through thick and thin. When the times are good, hey, that's not too tough, is it? But when the times are tough, we need to hang together. We need that kind of solidarity. And the values are the values of fairness, equality of opportunity, justice, that, that we share the value, our, our common sense about the value of public services and how important they are in our families and in our communities. We share that. And we also share a recognition of the value and the dignity of people's work. Yeah? Do we? Do we agree on that? Yeah. That's what binds us. So solidarity is based on those values. So, to speak really narrowly here today, the challenge for the incoming executive and the board is to build on those values. Those are the values that are going to move us forward. We need, let me speak as president of the National Union, as a leader of the National Union, along with Larry Brown and the, and the leadership across the country, I want to be crystal clear with you here this afternoon. We, across the country, need MGEU. Yeah. We need you. And we need you to be strong. We need you to be tight. We need you to be pulling and pulling together. So your executive board, the officers and the full board, will need your support as they pull and pull in the same direction, yeah? So whether you're a new delegate, you've been here for years, all of us need to be there to provide the support to them so that they can do, provide the leadership that we need to be strong. Now, for our part, Larry and I and the leadership across the country, we will assist in any way we can. We've, we, we, we've been through it, we've seen it, we've got some ideas. So we're not here to tell anybody what to do, but we are here ready, willing, and able to serve and to assist in any capacity or any way your leadership deems fit. Yes? So 
I talk about that because we need to be strong because the challenges that we're facing are huge. And I'm not going to go through them all. Many of the speakers, Kevin Reba, uh, many of the candidates when they're running for office and so on, you've spoken about them here today, but I just want to talk about a couple. First of all, in our view, and adopted by our convention of national, of, of, of members such as yourselves from across the country, we staked out five years ago this issue of income inequality. We said that the single biggest issue facing people right the way around the world is this growing gap between those that have and those that don't. Growing gap between those that have and those that don't. Because we know as income inequality continues to grow here in Manitoba, here in Canada, here in North America, right the way around the world, as income inequality grows, it is injurious to people, it is injurious to communities, it is injurious to society as a whole. Some people are doing fabulously well in this new economy, in this globalized economy of the last 20 and 25 years, and many others are not or they're slipping down and down and down. And so the question that we've posed to Canadians, and we're working with our colleagues internationally, is we want to know why is income inequality growing? Why does income inequality continue to grow? We think of it as a, I've talked about this before, as a murder mystery. Think of it as a murder mystery. Income inequality is injurious. Why is it there? and why does it continue to grow? And we argue there are three fundamental reasons. This is the work, this is, this, this is the analysis, if you will, that guides all of our work. Who did it? Why is it there? Why does it continue to rise? We're saying the first reason, and we can say this definitively after 20 years, is that if you continue to attack, if corporations continue to attack, and their friends in like-minded governments continue attack to attack workers' rights, then income inequality will continue to grow. Yeah? We know now, social scientists can demonstrate that as, as, as workers' rights are attacked and driven down, income inequality rises. It is estimated that in, here in Canada alone, in the last 15 years, 20% of the rise in income inequality is directly attributable to the fact that we're attacking workers' ability to organize and to bargain collectively. So that's one reason, yeah? The second reason is in this country, we don't have an industrial strategy. Successful, eco company, successful economies make stuff, yeah? They make stuff. Why is it we can travel to some of the Scandinavian countries and, we can, and, our, and, and the, 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 the trade unionists I meet, their children go to school for free? Yeah? It doesn't matter whether you come from the big house in the hill or you come from the, from the small house, you, you, you have little money, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You have access to education, to, name, to give you one example. They have an industrial strategy. They got together, business, government, labor, and they said, what do we want to do? How do we want to build our economy so that young people have opportunities, right? In Canada, we need an industrial strategy, an industrial strategy that recognizes people have to make stuff, yeah? And we can make stuff without injuring the environment, yeah? So, yeah, yeah, so, so at the heart, at the heart of any economic strategy is this notion that the strategy should be directed at two objectives. We want to have a clean environment, a good environment, and we also want to produce, in other words, we want to protect nature, and we want an economy whose goal is to provide support to people. 
It's people and nature. That's the way we move forward. In the absence of an industrial strategy, the gap keeps getting bigger and bigger. Kids scrambling around, piecing together two or three jobs, huge student debts and so on, as they try and put jobs together to provide a living for themselves and for their families, to have a future. Now the third reason why that gap goes bigger and bigger in income inequality is because we've ceased in this country to have a progressive tax system. Huh? Some people are paying too much taxes. Wait, 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 wait. Some people are paying too much because you know why? Some people aren't paying any. Yeah? You can't have a tax system, the one that's developed in this country for the last 30 years, which rewards a few at the expense of the many. You, when you see a government talking about, when you see a government talking about giving a corporation a tax break, that's that's bullshit. Yeah, I'll tell you why. That's not a that's not a cor, that, that, that's not a tax cut. That's taking scarce revenue out of the public purse. The, t the taxes that we all pay, we put it all in a pot to pay for health, to pay for social services, to pay for roads, to solve, solve. They're taking money that comes out of our pocket that we put in a pot. They're taking that money and giving it, spending it uh, on a tax break for somebody that's making millions of dollars or indeed they're running a corporation that's got tons of money stacked up in the bank. Come on. Now, as public sector workers, this is an important argument for us to understand. You see, because in the absence of money in the central till, what do they do? They cut, chop public services. Yeah? So when your members are saying to you, oh, come on, my union can't get me a better contract, why aren't you getting me more than this? We've got to talk to our members about the broad game that's afoot that's going on. Yeah? If, if you don't, if we don't sort out the revenues that governments are supposed to be receiving, then we're going to continually be on this wheel that goes round and round and round and round, and it's called privatization, layoffs, public-private partnerships, and so on, right? They're squeezing the services. Now, the reason that that's important is be, to come back to the question of income inequality. Why does income inequality grow? Income inequality grows because public services are what give people a shot at life, a chance at life. If you've got your health, you got a chance. Without your health, it's tough. Eh? If you've got an education, you've got a chance at life. Without an education, it's much, much more difficult. So think of the six-year-olds, six-year-olds, three six-year-olds. I'm not saying that they're all going to end up in the same spot, but surely when the race starts, they should all be at the, fin at the start line with shoes, socks, clothes, food, nutrition, so on and so forth. Yeah. So when you attack public services, you in, in fact increase income inequality. And income inequality is the number one issue facing this generation right the way around the world. Eh? Doesn't matter which God you honor, which religion you follow, what your sexual orientation is, whether you speak English, what, it doesn't, you could honor a different God, speak a different language, be halfway around the world. The issue that unites peoples of the world, the number one issue is growing income inequality. That's what it is. So when, we, when, they, when you talk about the big green bus, you know, and Kevin says, yeah, we're trying it a different way. Yeah, we want to speak to people and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's what the big green bus is about. We're going out and talking to our members. And we're talk, we've talked to thousands of Canadians across the country. MGU, I want to thank you for being part of that and for the work that you did in supporting that. Because we're deter thank you. No, no. We, we, we are determined that this conversation that we began three and four years ago will continue. Yeah? 
We're going to continue this conversation. We're going to reach beyond our own membership. We're going to talk to our membership. We're going to re reach beyond our own membership. And we're going to talk to them about income inequality. Because unless we deal with the fundamental root, you know, the why done it, who did it, why is it happening, unless we stop the attack on labor, unless we develop an industrial strategy, unless we get some tax fairness in our system, we're going to be on this wheel that goes round and round and round, and our kids are on the same wheel, and their kids are on the same wheel, and we go round and round and down and down and down. And there's no God, there's no blessed way that trade unionists, the trade unionists that we like to work with, there's no way we're going to stand on the sidelines and watch that happen. Yeah? yeah. There's a federal election coming up. I'm not going to belabor that point. Uh, I want to just make two points about elections. We're, we're, we're political, we're not partisan. Kevin went through that. We all understand that. That's an issue we fought 25 years ago in our unions, but we're way, you know. I, I just simply want to leave this with you about the elections. Um, there is, there, we have every obligation to be involved in some way, shape, and form as individuals and as unions in these elections. We can't stand on the sidelines and watch others determine who will get elected and what the public policy is that they're going to promote. It is stupid. We, can, we just can't do that. I want to give you one example. Last spring in Nova Scotia, there was a provincial election. The one government, which happened to be in this case, NDP, was out, and the new government came in. They were the Liberals. The new government's introduced two pieces of legislation within months, a couple of months of being re-elected, re re elected, majority government. They've got a five-year term. The first two pieces of legislation last May were anti-worker pieces of legislation and anti-public sector worker pieces of legislation in particular. Two weeks ago, that government introduced what we now refer to, it's called Bill 1. Bill 1, in effect, means that our union, your sister union, the, M, the, the NSGU, roughly the same size as Manitoba, Manitoba's union, stands to lose 9,500 members that they've organized and bargained for for over 20 years. A quarter of their membership to a third of their membership gone like that. Eh? Now, I can't tell you how much time we're spending on that because that's what we do in the National Union. It is a family, right? So one of our members is getting, you know, hurt. So we're spending tons of time right now working with them and bringing the resources to bear from across the country to, sit, to make sure that we can help MGU push back this terrible piece of legislation that's being introduced. My call, Larry's been out there. Uh, Larry and I are on a plane tonight at 6 o'clock back home. Uh, he thinks he's going to be able to rake some leaves in his garden tomorrow morning before he gets on a plane tomorrow afternoon. I don't think so. Um, but that's what, that, 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 that's, that's what we're doing. That's part of our work is to mobilize people and to be in there and to say to those workers in Nova Scotia, health care workers, by the way, health care workers, by the way, right? Our job, our job includes going down there and standing with those workers shoulder to shoulder. Not behind them, not saying, oh well, we hope it goes well. No, our job is to go down there and stand shoulder to shoulder with them and work with the whole team of experts that we're bringing together to try and push back. My point about that was simply this. If you don't think elections make a difference, give your head a shake. <laughs> I'm not telling you who to vote for. You notice I haven't told you who to vote for. I'm not, I, I don't tell our members how to vote. They're bright enough to figure that out themselves. But I do say that you have to figure ways as a union, you have an obligation to figure out ways as a union to make sure that our voice and that our views on public policy matters are heard. Now, in that regard, I'm going to end by just simply talking about one issue that is dominating and will dominate the work of MGU and the work of every component in the National Union for the next three or four years, and that's the issue of privatization. Okay? 
Yeah, you know privatization, the playbook, private, you know the playbook privatization? How many people know about that? Well, you know it. It's, a, you know, the privatization playbook, right? What they do is they, 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 what governments do is they starve a service of funding, eh? They cut back the funding, do more with less. Oh, let's bring in a lean program. Oh, we've got a new way of TQM management, whatever it is, blah, 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 blah. Bottom line is, is they're asking frontline workers to do more with less, yeah? Corrections, cor corrections blown past red lines with, with uh, inmate counts, uh, healthcare workers, caseloads, right? You know, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? You know, yeah? So what they do, remember, remember the big analysis, no fair taxes, squeeze public services, that's part of it. But on the privatization book, first they starve the services, squeeze the services. Second, they do that by giving tax cuts, or what I call the tax giveaways. Well, there's no money in the kitty. You've got to do more. Look, there's, no, there's not the same money in the committee. There's no goddamn money in the committee, kip, kip, kitty, because you just handed it out to that guy. And that person over there up who lives in the top of the hill, come on. So if they cut the funding, they, they starve the services, and then when there's a lack of funding, it means that the, um, the quality of the service deteriorates, right? The accessibility to the service deteriorates. And I can't tell you how many workers we meet and talk with across the country that deliver public services because it means it's more than a paycheck to them. It's, it, 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 they're doing it because they, they value, it brings value to the community. I can't tell you how many workers we meet across the country who weep when they talk about how their clients are being shortchanged because they can't do the job that they want to do. Yeah? So on the privatization book, so that happens, the lack of funding means service levels deteriorate. And then finally the public gets pissed off. The public says, well, they get so frustrated with the service, they say, well, what, 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 what are we paying our taxes for? We can't get the service we want. Why are we paying taxes? And then the final play in the playbook, the fifth play, is the CEOs, the transnational corporations, the private for profit operators step in and say, hey, we've got a solution. We can run the services, yeah? That's the privatization playbook, right? We couldn't say that with such certainty 15 or 20 years ago. But now we've got enough examples where we can say it with absolute certainty that this privatization stuff that's going on, new names for it, same old game, it's a shell game. And who, who suffers? Three groups. The workers that provide the service, the taxpayers that are trying to use the service, and the taxpayer as a whole because it costs more in final analysis and the service is poor and the workers bear the brunt of the costs. Yeah? yeah? So, we know about that. We know that right now, let me, let me give you one example. In Newfoundland and Labrador, the government announced last March that they're, they're privatizing some services for uh, adults, challenged adults who need housing, right? So they announced that they're privatizing, but the government said, no, no, but we're privatizing it to a non-profit company. It's a non-profit company. Well, the public says, well, well, you weren't doing it very good, and so I guess we could try it with a non-profit company. And they signed a contract with a non-profit company. But the non-profit company, which is established in Newfoundland, is owned by a for-profit company in the UK. It's called Key Assets in Newfoundland, and in the UK, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it runs under a different name in the UK. So here's, so that, the, the UK company is a multinational company that operates in four or five countries so far around the world, and it's selling its service to the citizens of, Newf as, of, of Newfoundland and Labrador as a non-profit. Hey, come on, what a scam, right? And the non-profit, what the non-profit does in Newfoundland, it pays a fee to the parent company. No, it doesn't make money in Newfoundland. No, of course it doesn't make money, because it pays a huge administrative fee to the parent company in the UK. Come on. You know, and I could go on example after example. That's the wave of privatization that is going to start to hit us and hit us hard across this country. 
And we are determined, we are determined that our components in the National Union, working together, working collectively, will put up a fight. We will persuade the public in a way that we couldn't 20 years ago, but now we have the evidence. We are confident that we're going to be able to sh sh uh, persuade the public that what we need to do is have more transparency and more accountability when governments start to talk about privatization or alternative service delivery or public-private partnerships and so on and so forth. Will you stand with us on that? Yeah. There's so much to talk about, but there's so little time, and you have more business to do at this convention. But I want to close by saying to you, and so I want to close, I should close, um, but I, I, I want to close by saying that to, to work in public services demonstrates one of the fundamental values that we as humans bring to this little old place called the Earth, eh? 24,000 miles around, hangs out there in space, right? Those values are the values of sharing and caring, you know? When I've worked with, I've worked with public employees, I've been a public employee, uh, my life has been dedicated, along with Larry and others, to the quality of public services. Public services are what make a real difference in people's lives. And the values that we bring to them and that our membership bring to them are values of sharing and caring. We're not going to let, uh, we're not going to allow others to trash those values or trash our members that represent those values. We also recognize that we're trade unionists. We're public sector trade unionists. And to the new delegates, I, 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 you, this may not ring true for you now, but I, 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 if you hang in there and work with us and allow us to work with you, you, I think, will come to the same conclusion that I did when I was young and coming up through the ranks. To be a trade unionist is a calling. It's a calling. Yeah? It's the, it's, it's, the values that you, it's the values that you stand on, the values that bring us together. That's what's going to carry us through. That's what's carried us through in, pa in past generations. That will carry us through in these, these challenging times we live in. So, in short, when we work together, we win. Yeah? Let's go forward. Let's win together. Thank you very much.